What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. You know, I think this was an awesome year in country music, both in the independent scene, but also in the mainstream scene. I think that country music was in a really healthy, really fun spot in 2019. And that's great because for the past five years, everything has felt so homogenous, so suffocatingly similar. It's like going to an ice cream parlor and the only scoop that was available was vanilla for years. But in 2019, I feel like things started to splinter. Things started to get weird. You would sometimes look at the radio chart even and be like, hmm, those are three pretty good songs. And it's felt like it's been a while since we could really say that. So I am so excited to count down the top 10 best country music albums of 2019 with all of you. As always in these videos, these are just my opinion. I'm a dude, you know? That's as much authority as I have. And I put my opinions out there on the internet, but it doesn't mean your taste is wrong. It doesn't mean my taste is right. So I'd love to hear what you guys like and if you vibe with any of these albums too. And I hope maybe you find something that you really enjoy here in the mix. And even though the title of this video is the top 10 country albums, I'll give you 20. But we're gonna very quickly run through 20 through 11 right now. And I'm gonna do honorable mentions later because I just wanna share the love. At number 20 is the Cactus Blossoms' Easy Way. This is an album that'll give you 60s vibes with some Everly Brother shades, awesome harmonies, really fun, almost Hawaiian sound. At 19 is Cody Johnson's On My Way To You. This is full of his big belty vocals, really rock solid songs, and it's cool to see an artist from Texas really make it in a mainstream sense. At number 18 is Vince Gill's Oki. This is a really gentle, wise album. It would feel like talking to a really mature grandparent. It covers all ranges of topics that are happening in our society with a really unifying tone. At number 17, Aaron Watson's Red Bandana. This is kind of Aaron Watson's opus. This album is sort of overly long and kind of messy, but it's just passionate. It breathes. At number 16, Yola's Through the Fire. I love this album. I love the kind of country soul fusion that Yola is bringing. I think she totally deserves this Grammy nomination and I'm happy to have her in the country music conversation. At number 15 is Midland's Let It Roll. This album's a little bit sleazy. It's a little bit tender, but it's wrapped up in this gorgeous production by Shane McNally. It's got that throwback sound, lovely harmony, great instrumentation. It's rollicking and cool and just sounds great. At number 14, I'm saying Jason Hawk Harris's Love and the Dark. Now this was a new artist to me this year, but I was blown away by the honesty and the songwriting on this album. Talking about addiction, talking about faith, talking about the death of family members, talking about so much in a really frank way, gave me major shades of Jason Isbell. And number 13 is Miranda Lambert's Wild Card. I think this album is honest and it's a lot more accessible than the real subdued moment of the weight of these wings. It's cool to hear Miranda have some of her swagger back, but not sacrificing any of her honesty. And even though the production choices by Jay Joyce can be really hit or miss for me, they really grew on me as I listened to this record and marked a next step for Miranda Lambert's career. At 12 is Between the Country by Ian No. This guy's from Kentucky and this album is beautiful and really feels inspired by Appalachia. It'll give you major shades of Bob Dylan and his delivery style, but there is awesome storytelling on here, whether it's Today Doesn't Do Me In uh, or Barbara's Song or the most popular track from this record, Letter to Madeline. And then at number 11, Country Squire by Tyler Childers. This is a finely made album. It sounds awesome. I think the production's a major level up. And even though for some Tyler Childers fans, that means he's not the little secret of the indie country world, it's definitely an album that adds fun into his catalog, a lot of humor. All You're In is romantic, Ever Loving Hand is naughty and fun, and Country Squire is a jam. And with that said, let's jump into the top 10. Decided to switch sides for the top 10. Don't really know why, but I'm gonna cover up Mr. Wolf over here with uh, the album covers. And a lot of people ask me about this, Total side note, I made that myself. I didn't buy it anywhere. It's just made out of paint samples from Lowe's, which is a thing I do because it's cheap and I think a cool way to decorate. But I have that on a shirt. I'm just dipping my toe into the merch world if you're interested. It's linked down below. At number 10, I've got Cody Jinx's The Wanting. There's a black and a white wolf in me And I live and I die Now, Cody released two albums this year, After the Fire and The Wanting. And while After the Fire is a little bit more subdued and has really intense, beautiful lyrics, I think The Wanting was the album that I found myself going back to more because it's a little bit more melody driven. This album has all of the tortured soul searching that makes Cody Jinx so popular and it's got really dark and brooding tones about it, but it's balanced with this sort of hope as well. I mean, this is an album about feeling crazy, about having two sides of his personality. Sometimes he's a raven, sometimes he's a dove. He says that on the final track on the album. 
He says, there's a black and a white wolf in me, and it just depends which one I feed in terms of which person I'm going to end up living like. The album's also about him coming to terms with his fame, and the fact that that makes him feel really isolated in society, the fact that that makes him a bad romantic partner because of his status. Actually, I'd say my highlight of the whole record was a song he co-wrote with his wife, Rebecca, called Never Alone, Always Lonely. That's about how the rock star life ain't all it's cracked up to be. And number nine is Reba McIntyre's Stronger Than The Truth. There's no you in Oklahoma, and that's okay with me. Reba went and made a straight up classic country album with no apologies for the twang, for the fiddle, for the saloon honky tonk vibes. And we got songs like No You in Oklahoma and Tammy Wynette Kind of Pain that just feel, I mean, from another era. They feel like they're from 50 years ago and I mean that in a great way. Reba's also got an amazing storytelling voice and on songs like The Clown and Cactus in a Coffee Can, she emotes pain in an incredibly tender and beautiful and believable way. Somewhere over Denver I ask her if there's a real criticism I have of the album, it's just the last song on it, Freedom, which was the single they sent to radio. But I get it, she's trying to play the game and get some radio exposure, but it stands out like a sore thumb on here on an otherwise really strong, sassy, honest, fun, cool record. And number eight is Luke Combs' What You See Is What You Get. Luke had a lot to live up to with the follow-up to This One's For You, which was this record-breaking smash a few years ago. And I'd say he did it and then some with What You See Is What You Get. I think it's a better album all the way around. I think the sound is a lot more honed in, the instruments are allowed to shine a lot more in the production, and his vocals are on point throughout. Honestly, this is just a crowd-pleasing record. I have been saying this all year. I think his success and his appeal and his accessibility is such a significant story story and he's almost like the Garth of this generation. And the great thing is the songs are there. There's so much excellent writing and fun music on this record. Just cause I'm leaving, it don't mean it. Whether it's the Brooks and Dunn vibes of loving on you, or whether it is the storytelling on a song like Refrigerator Door, or the wordplay on One Too Many, or the romance on Better Together, or the positivity on something like the title track, this album just has a vibe of gratitude. And sure, at 17 songs, I skip a few of them too. But on the whole, it's just a rock solid, important record. At number seven is George Strait's Honky Tonk Time Machine. It's a given. I'm just noticing while filming that this section of my list is a little 90s revival because we got Reba, then we have Brooks and Dunn featured on the Luke Combs record, and now we got George Strait. And for a while this year, they were like the top three albums on iTunes, I remember, and I was like, the 90s are back, and they really were. George Strait may have retired from touring, but this album is excellent and he's sitting here saying i'm not done yet every little honky tonk bar was fun and it had a nice little piano groove and all the instruments in general it's so nice to hear something free of the snap tracks there's a lot of fun on this record whether it's sing one with willie or whether it's a song called blue water which is just a summer jam but i really love on this record when it slows down and george gets reflective a song like God and country music is just kind of a mission statement for what matters to him in life. George sings with all of the clarity and charisma that have made him the king of Texas country. And I think you guys will enjoy this if you're a George Strait fan, which who isn't? And number six is Randy Hauser's Magnolia. Well, there ain't no grass gonna grow up under my feet. This was the very first album I reviewed this year. And by the way, shout out to the Reddit user Cyrus Waugh, who compiled all of the ratings I've given to every album this year. That was really like useful to look back on as I prepared for this list. And interesting to see which albums grew on me and which kind of I drifted away from as the year went on. But anyway, I reviewed Magnolia and I was blown away by it. And that stayed with me all year. I mean, honestly, I've never taken Randy Hauser that seriously. It's obvious that he has a great voice, but songs like Running Out of Moonlight or we went just didn't feel like anything special and Randy Hauser actually acknowledges that right at the onset of this album he says I went to Nashville played the part and took a broken guitar through the heart 
And then he proceeds to deliver an album that's much more what he would want to say and how he would want to present himself, and it's irresistible. There are themes of restlessness and travel on songs like No Stone Unturned and Evangeline, where he sings about taking his woman down to the Mississippi River and showing her where he's from. There are real soulful moments on No Good Place to Cry, which is one of the vocals of the year. With another woman to blame and also What Whiskey Does, which was the single. And then there are songs that are like the fun radio jams, kind of like the stereotype I used to have of Randy Hauser. But balanced with all the substance, it just makes a really great record that stuck with me all year. At number five is Mike and the Moon Pies, Cheap Silver, and Solid Country Gold. But you look good to me, I'm, you gave me your life. Mike and the Moon Pies is a band whose reputation precedes them. I know they're from Texas. I know they are really respected by a lot of people whose music opinions I respect. But until this year, I hadn't checked them out. And upon doing so, I was like, what the hell have I been doing? And people that know my taste well chose the right moment to recommend them to me because I like a little touch of sophistication in the production of country albums. And damn, this album sounds sophisticated. And that makes sense. They recorded this in London with an orchestra. And the mix you get of this Texas country band with all these orchestral European sounds is so cool. I mean, it feels like James Bond going on a road trip through New Mexico. That was the vibe it gave me the first time. Something very posh, but something very honky-tonk at the same time. And I was like, I have not heard something like this, and I love it. It's kind of got shades of the famous country politan sound. Songs like the title track or You Look Good in Neon fill me with euphoria. This is your last chance. And the lead singer, Mike Harmeyer, Harmeyer, I'm not sure how you say his name, has a certain agility to his voice that can do runs really quickly that I find super interesting as well. I just love this record. The only reason it's not higher on the list is because at eight songs, it kind of falls somewhere between EP and album to me, but it's well worth your attention and I hope you check it out. And we're staying in Texas for number four. It's Flatland Cavalry's Homeland Insecurity. You built a castle in the sky, thought he's never gonna come back. If y'all follow me on Twitter, you know I freaked out when I discovered this band, when I discovered this album. I was like, this is the second coming of the Turnpike Troubadours, but with a certain kind of youthful, naive brightness and hopefulness to their sound. They have a little slogan that says, we play music that's easy on the ears and heavy on the heart, and I think they nailed it with this record. One of my favorite things about this band is just the fiddle, and it's there, big, loud, proud on almost every song here. Fiddles are interesting because I feel like they make songs somehow both more whimsical and happy and more lonesome and somber and paired up with the kind of Texas dance hall drummy sound of the band. It's just cool. And I think Cleto Cordero, who's the lead singer of this band, is just someone special. He has a way with words. He's a great writer on songs like Pretty Women. He starts that off with uh, like all of this consonance on no shade of ruby, red, red, lonely, blonde. And I've mentioned that line before, that I love ruby red Revlon lip liner, because you get R-R-R-L-L-L, and it's fun to say. And even though you get some really sad, lonely moments at different parts of this record, I feel like they understand flow. And ultimately, I'd say the band feels really resilient and hopeful, whether that's on the opener, Come Back Down, or on the closer, Years From Now, which just has the most gorgeous musical build that's so fun to go out on with this album. Before we get into the top three, let's just do a couple little honorable mentions. These are really just notable albums that I think have a lot of merit to them, but I just didn't think had a place on this list. Zach Bryan's debut album, Deanne. It's rough around the edges, but this guy's kind of become one of the breakout stars of the year. The High Women's debut record is super interesting. For me, way too much unison singing that kind of takes me out of the moment, but there's a few standouts on there like Loose Change or the song The High Women, which features Yola. I liked Gabe Lee's album Farmland and I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention. In the mainstream world, I think there's a lot to like on Hardy's Hicks tape and a lot of smart songs that some people might not want to admit are that smart. I also think Jake Owen's Greetings from Jake has been pretty underrated for a really solid album. Runaway June had a really promising start with Blue Roses. Billy Strings is someone 
one that I'm recently getting into and I'm enjoying his new take on bluegrass. But if there's an album that I really, really, really want to highlight as an honorable mention, it's Robert Ellis's Texas Piano Man. This album rules. I'm only not including it in this video because I can't in good faith call it a country album. This album is kind of like Elton John-ish uh, piano pop, but he's got this big, you know, Texas accent. And I'm not saying it's bad because it's not country. I'm just saying like, this isn't a country album, but it freaking rules. I mean, Father is such an honest song. He Made Me Do It is vampy and naughty. Topo Chico and Lime, that song's a good time. I mean, Robert Ellis made something awesome. And now let's get to the top three. At number three is an album that stopped me dead in my tracks when I heard it for the first time. It's Traveling Mercies by Emily Scott Robinson. Was it the dress I wore? Was it the wine he poured? Was there some sign I ignored? Was Emily is a singer and songwriter from North Carolina. She has a very beautiful, gentle delivery style, but despite the gentleness of her sound, this album will devastate you. You may have heard about her song, The Dress, which is just the most honest and confused tale about sexual assault that you could imagine. She makes it full of the shades of gray that make life so complicated. There's other songs on here that feel equally as confessional, like Run, about leaving an abuser. And then there's moments where she's storytelling, like on Delta Line, where she's kind of imagining different women on this train and how everyone is carrying a pain with them and a secret. But there's also a really sweet and positive side to this record too. And on songs like Westward Bound, you get shades of Dolly Parton in the way that she tells stories with specific details. Past the cornfields and the UFO museum, little churches washed in white. As I say on this channel too much, I love words and I love interesting words and so does she. And she loves shades of gray and she loves looking at the world around her and making sense of it. And she's got this willowy delivery style that's so open and beautiful. And this album, I promise you, will stop you in your tracks and be like, why are we not all talking about Emily Scott Robinson? At number two is Charles Wesley Godwin's Seneca. They put a roof over my head in the armor on the tanks in Normandy. Charles Wesley Godwin comes from West Virginia and this album is named for the Seneca Creek that ran through his town. And he has very quickly established himself as one of the most interesting independent country artists and main figureheads in the kind of rise of the Appalachian sound. A lot of people think Texas has been leading kind of the new outlaw movement. I would argue it's happening much more out of Appalachia with Sturgill and Tyler and Kelsey Walden and certainly Charles Wesley Godwin. Trees in his foes never come around this town, nor I throw my fists and give them hell and sand my ground. This album is really a reflection on growing up in coal country, in a town that's been ravaged by poverty, where the industry that once made it vibrant is now no longer supporting it. This album will transport you to the hollers and the creeks and the mines and the echoes and the, the birds and the grandparents and the smoke and, and everything that kind of defines Seneca Creek. And yet the star through all of the vivid imagery in these songs is Charles Wesley Godwin's truly unique voice. We got married and danced to Canon and I kind of have trouble describing it. I think I called it a bleat at one point. You might say there's a warble, but it's got like a certain husky gravitas to it that just is so compelling to listen to. But there's painful beauty in songs like Sorry for the Wait. There's true barn stomping fun on a song like Hardwood Floors. There's romance on Strawberry Queen. There's just so much that's great here and I can't wait for you guys that haven't checked it out yet to check it out because I think you will love it. And then my number one album of 2019, I feel like some of you guys know this is coming, is John Party's Heartache Medication. I went back and forth on putting this album at number one. I knew it would be near the top, but there was a part of me that was like, uh, shouldn't I just highlight an indie artist at number one, not someone signed to a major label, but Honestly, I think it's its own challenge to work within the major label system and still make something that feels unique, 
that feels true to the artist and that is really compelling and instrumental and good. And John Party nailed it. To me, this album, coming out of Music Row, coming out of the Nashville system, coming from a major label, is such a big statement because it is instrumental. It is this agreeable, lovely country that's very fiddle forward, that feels very Western in its sound. And if you want some of that dance hall, Bakersfield, fun vibe that you haven't heard in 20 years or so, this is the album for you. I've come back to this album over and over and over and over again this year because it's just so rich. It's a ton of fun. Uh, you've got your sad moments. You've got your partying moments. You've got your romantic moments. You've got this kind of through line of respect for what country music is is there's a song on here called call me country that's a pretty badass protest song i know that john party's voice isn't for everyone but i think his producer bart butler captures it really well here and i think he delivers these songs with true charisma whether it's just in dumb little lines like i'd like to keel a little time with you which is the low-key bop of this record I want to keel a little time with you. Uh, or it's just words like there's a lot of us old cats that ain't ready to give old hat the boot. You know, it's smart. When the album slows down a little bit, like Don't Blame It on Whiskey, which is the duet with Lauren Elena, or uh, Ain't Always the Cowboy, which kind of is a twist on the idea that it's always the cowboy that's riding away. They're just interesting, good, strong songs. And if you're not just blown away by the frenzied excitement at the end of Me and Jack and the instrumentalist going 10,000 miles an hour, Man, you ain't no fun, because it is such a good time. This whole record is a good time. And like I said, I love what this album represents. I feel like we saw with California Sunrise, John Party's last record, the potential for him to become a real leader in the neo-traditional sort of turning back to the 90s country sound thing that's happening in country music right now with other acts like Midland, even Riley Green, Runaway June. And I think with this album, like all our hopes were sort of realized and he made something great, compelling, fun, crowd pleasing. That's not easy to do in a major label situation. And we've seen a lot of artists be unable to let their voice come through. And I think John Party did. And that just makes me so excited. So if you're one of those people that put Nashville on mute a long time ago, that says, I don't want anything to do with the mainstream country scene, I think this is a great place to start. And it might make you feel a little bit more generous to all of the music that's coming out of Nashville right now. And that's it, guys. Those are my top 10 slash 20 slash like 30 albums in this video of 2019. I loved what this year was for country music, and I loved getting to share it all with you. Um, I've got tons of reviews on this channel. Most of them are going to be in album roundups, but go ahead and check those out if you're interested. Like this video, share it, recommend to me something in the comments down below you think I missed. Coming up later, we're going to have the best songs and the best hit songs. So um, look forward to those coming down the pipe, and I will see you guys then. Bye.